Did Disney just manage to do a good book adaptation? It hasn't been a great year for Disney. They've lost a lot of money putting out content that went through the motions but lacked heart, soul, and often anything resembling a coherent plot. So when I went to watch the first episode of Disney's new adaptation of the Percy Jackson series by Rick Reardon, it was more with a sense of obligation than enthusiasm. And then I was astonished to find that not only is this adaptation more pleasant than the aroma of stale hockey gear, it's fun and faithful to the source material. As a heads up, this review is a comparison between the literary source and the TV adaptation, so if you care about spoilers, go read the book, then watch the show, then come back. A lot of fans of the Percy Jackson series were disappointed by the first film adaptation from over 10 years ago. The first mistake was in the casting. In the books, Percy Jackson is 12 years old, and finding a 12-year-old with the acting chops to carry the lead in a major motion picture is a tall order. More often than not, you end up with a Ron Weasley situation. By bumping the age of Percy Jackson to 17 in these films, the producers were able to hire better, more mature actors. But this came at the cost of, like, the entire tone of the story. Behaviors and decisions that make sense for a 12-year-old can seem a bit strange for a 17-year-old, and I think that even if the film's other flaws had been avoided, the decision to age up Percy left them compromised from the beginning. So, fans of the series will be pleasantly pleased to hear the scratchy, broken, creaking voice of a literal, actual 12-year-old reciting lines straight from the first page of the book. Look, I didn't want to be a half-blood, says Percy. And then the hairs on your arms raise up because you think, oh my gosh, did these filmmakers actually read the book? Readers, they have. Walker Scobell is very well cast in the lead role. The writers gave him the right amount to work with for his age and experience, and he puts in a great performance, often showing better chops than some of the adults in the cast. The only quibble fans might have is that he doesn't have black hair and green eyes, as in the book, but that's kind of up to you how much that matters. I suspect the filmmakers may have done that on purpose, though, because one criticism you can level at the Percy Jackson series is that it resembles Harry Potter so much that it's borderline plagiarism at times— right down to the black hair and green eyes of the orphaned, superpowered protagonists. The similarities are so obvious that Rick Reardon's even written an essay in his own defense addressing this issue. The opening monologue is a condensed version of the opening paragraphs of the book. The fantastic hook is right there, and it's a smart move, because if you tell kids not to read a book, you can bet your favorite pair of socks that they will read it. That same premise works when you tell kids not to watch a TV show. The rest of episode 1 is a condensed version of chapters 1 through 4 of The Lightning Thief. As I said, there are some pretty strong parallels to Harry Potter. A weird, orphaned, preteen kid who gets bullied a lot goes on a field trip in the big city. The mean kid pushes him a little too far, and surprise! He has superpowers that are really good for revenge. For fans of the series, I'm not slamming these books. They're really enjoyable, and I think kids should read them both for fun and to help them learn more about Greek mythology. But the similarities between Percy Jackson and Harry Potter are too similar not to notice them. So I'm noticing them. Please don't dox me, superfans. The filmmakers threw in nice little details that show they actually read the books and care about what's in them. Percy and his mom like to eat blue food together. She also always brings him sweets from her job at a candy store whenever he comes home from school. This is nicely referenced when she hands him a bag of blue sweets as he returns to the apartment. The importance of this is referenced in the next episode, which tells me the writers have made an actual plan. Another nice touch is when Percy is in the museum and he attempts to read the worksheet his teacher gave him. The letters shift around on the page, visualizing Percy's dyslexia. I've heard from more than one person with dyslexia that this effect really showed what it feels like sometimes. And if any of you have dyslexia, I'd be interested to hear what you thought of this moment. There are some changes I'm not a fan of, though. In the book, Percy's teacher and best friend Grover are really the legendary centaur Chiron and a satyr, like as in Mr. Tumnus's third cousin. They watch over Percy and conceal the truth about the fact that his father is the Greek god Poseidon. In the book, Chiron and Grover hide information because they have to. The more Percy knows, the more evident his powers will be, and the more danger he'll be in. In the TV episode, though, Grover betrays Percy 
lying about the events of the field trip in order to get him expelled from school. In the book, Grover actually tries to take the blame for Percy, despite the fact that this will get him in trouble with their meanest teacher. The book version of events proves that Grover is completely loyal and trustworthy, and the TV show makes him seem shady and manipulative. I didn't like this change. It wasn't necessary to condense the plot, and this kind of behavior would make Percy less likely to ever trust Grover again. However, this annoying alteration can be used as a discussion topic for kids. If you're a parent or teacher, you can ask your kids what they thought of this change. How did it affect Grover's character and his relationship with Percy? Do the kids think the TV show should have done things differently? These sorts of seemingly small character moments are actually pretty important, and studying them can help young readers not just notice more things about characters in the books they read, but also write better stories themselves. The other change that I'm not a fan of is that Percy's stepdad Gabe is not the menacing, clearly abusive creep we see in the book. He's more pathetic than anything else. In the TV adaptation, Percy's quite comfortable sassing back to Gabe, and his mother Sally is not intimidated by him at all. She shouts back at him and informs him that she's taking her son on vacation rather than placating him and asking permission as seen in the book. I don't know why they soften Gabe so much, because he's supposed to be a bad character, the same as Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia in the Harry Potter books. Gabe fails to serve as an antagonist, and viewers will feel no tension or worry for Percy and Sally. It would have been better to write him out of the show entirely, rather than change him so much. One other minor quibble is that too much of the episode is filled up with Percy's mom explaining stuff. I know first episodes of a TV show are hard to pull off, You have to explain enough so that new viewers will know what's going on, but I don't think we needed this much backstory right away. They just needed to introduce us to Percy and get the action rolling. This actually affected the plot when Percy's mom takes forever to say goodbye to him after they crash the Camaro. It's like, there's an angry minotaur right there coming to kill you, and you're standing around chatting like you're at a coffee shop waiting for the barista to finish your lattes. In the amount of time it takes for Percy's mom to say goodbye, the kids could have made it past the monster-proof magical boundary and into safe territory. This scene is much shorter in the book, and it works a lot better. Parents worried about on-screen violence can rest assured, as the fight scene between Percy and the Minotaur is filmed at night in the pouring rain. There's no visible blood or gore, and the fight happens in lightning-illuminated silhouette. But it's still really exciting. It sets the tone of the show as being appropriate for ages 10 to 12 and up. I wouldn't recommend it for younger kids, as the scary moments and coming-of-age tale just won't work for them. So, concluding thoughts. Seeing a minotaur in a pair of tidy whities was very funny without wrecking the tone of the fight scene, and it would have been nice if the characters had New York accents. Percy's supposed to be from the Upper East Side of New York, but he sounds like he's from nowhere in particular. Also, that poor Camaro deserved more screen time. I don't need, like, Michael Bay levels of loving close-ups, but at least getting to see that gorgeous thing properly before it was wrecked would have been nice. R.I.P. Camaro. So that's episode one. Disney has managed to do what I thought was impossible for them these days. They revisited a beloved franchise and didn't make foul-smelling corporate sludge out of it. This was a good episode. Since I'm going to be doing more reviews of film and TV adaptations of children's books, I decided I needed a rating system. I've settled on Snape's. Alan Rickman's performance of Severus Snape was one of the best parts of the Harry Potter films, and an example of how a character can make the migration from page to screen in a way that leaves room for actors and directors to give their own interpretation, while still being faithful to the character from the book. Whenever I review an on-screen adaptation of a children's book, I'll give it a rating based on how well I think it interprets the source material. There will always need to be changes when turning a book into a film or TV series, but those changes need to be faithful to the spirit of the original work. The first episode of Percy Jackson and the Olympians gets four out of five Snapes from me. I had to knock off one star because they made Grover into a backstabbing little snitch, and they turned Gabe from an actual menace into just like a lousy roommate. And they didn't ever let me properly see that Camaro. R.I.P. Camaro. I'll be back soon with more reviews of Percy Jackson and the Olympians, as well as other film and TV adaptations of great books written for kids. 
Come on over to childrensliteraturepodcast.com to catch regular episodes of the show, which looks at great books for children and the brilliant writers who create them. I'll see you soon with more reviews. Thanks for listening.